Hello everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the first leadership talk series uh, in Q1 2022. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to have Dr. Arun Shastri with us. He's right there next to me and uh, ready to hear his story and uh, his exciting work. And uh, it's a yes. And also it's very nice to have uh, Arun's father with us, SN Shastri. Um, he is also in the call. It's great to have you, sir. Um, if you are in a video, it will be nice to see your son talking. So again, it's another honor to have you with us to see how uh, your son has done a, an amazing uh, accomplishment to the research community and uh, to you know share his experience on the rare diseases. Um, So a little bit of uh, biodata about Dr. Arun. Uh, Dr. Arun has completed his PhD from University of Madras in 2010. Uh, he worked in the field of immunogenetic markers in the autoimmune diabetes uh, under the supervision of uh, Padmashree Dr. V. Mohan. Everybody knows him. Mohan Diabetes Research Foundation has, has been a leading diabetic center in many, many places. So um, I'm glad you had a great mentor and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, and also he got many rewards, his guest research scholarship from Swedish Institute, uh, I think with the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, he's got CSR research, uh, research fellowship award. And uh, he moved to the industry side to orchid chemicals and pharmaceuticals in Chennai and started working on proof of concepts on in vitro models for new drug discovery programs and diabetics metabolic syndrome, inflammation and oncology. And then there is a U-turn where he started a new dimension uh, to his career on looking on rare diseases and trying to identify the drugs. Uh, that's the story we're going to hear from Arun is about uh, his efforts on dystrophy annihilation research trust, the DART, um, India's first research and development facility in Bangalore. Uh, dedicated to finding the cure for the Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the DMD disease. Uh, and I think his journey started in 2013. Um, and then he has established the entire workflow, entire preclinical research development. Um, and also he has, you know, some of the outputs of the preclinical work to the to the therapy, which is the most exciting part of the talk. Um, and also there's a spin-off of Anugen Therapeutics. Um, and something we'll also hear the, the Anagon workflow on the GMP certified in house oligosynthesis uh, facility. Um, and all the effort has led Dr. Arun to look at various ways to, you know, make his presence in the, the RAD disease, working with ICMR, I think your PI in ICMR RAD disease registry project. Um, so as won a lot of national international awards and grants so to cure against rare diseases so um, we are really honored to have you dr arun and uh, the floor is yours so i'm going to give it to you um, thank you dinesh at the outset, I would like to thank Dinesh and Thermo Fisher Scientific to invite me for this leadership series talk. I am really honored coming from the other side of using Thermo Fisher reagents as and equipments as a researcher and coming to this side now speaking about my research. It's a good experience and my talk is going to be was I lost in translation? Trying to make sense out of antisense. This is going to be a talk of more of my journey, what I have taken in my life and the turns and twists which has led me to the current position. There will be a bit of science also in this. I was born in 1982. I'm the first born in my family. I was born as a premature baby, always eager to come early. So in seven months I was out and the doctors had you know that time had trouble. They said that I could find it difficult to survive. And obviously with the prayers from my parents and me as a bond fighter survived and I have lived for around 40 years. 
hope to go on more. My parents have been always supportive and I dedicate all my work towards them. My dad is online here and my mom, she is no more, but she is a motivation and inspiration behind this. As a kid, I was always interested and motivated in studying and my parents have really supported me. A small incident from my childhood where uh, I had assisted my father and his friend who had gone to Kendri Vidyalaya for the first standard entrance exam. And although I was in LKG, I insisted that even I want to write the exam. And the principal being my father's best friend, he said, OK, the kid wants to just try. OK, let him play. And I ended up topping the exam and I got straight away into the first standard, skipping the UKG. This is my grandfather, uh, Pandit E.M.N. Shastri, who, who, is a, who is to be a Hindi Sanskrit Pandit. And based on his studies from the Vedic Patshala, he got the title of Shastri and all of us have retained that surname now. And uh, he used to be very active in the propagation of Hindi through the Dakshin Bharat Hindi Prachar Sabha. So even though we are Tamil Brahmins born in Kerala, Hindi used to be like our mother tongue. My parents both were in the bank, so we used to keep getting transferred across India. And I did my 10th standard from Army School Gorakhpur. And this is one of the photos from those days where, you know, taking photographs used to be a rare event. And this is one of the event captured, uh, which shows that I had good inclination towards science and scientific projects. And this is one of the competition which the school had held. And uh, me and my team, we won the first prize on that. And uh, science has been a motivation here. Uh, actually, in this photograph, you can see the person in the suit. He uh, was our physics teacher. He was the only teacher with a PhD. So that was a motivation for me because till then we used to see a lot of teachers, but I could make out that a PhD can really change your DNA. I joined for my bachelor's here in Bangalore in Satisa Institute of Higher Learning. I'm very close to my college now. <laughs> the Thermo Fisher campus is very <laughs> close to Kadugudi here. And I used to be an average student, used to always get bored with the theory, but when it comes to experiments and practicals, I used to always enjoy it. And these are my classmates, and now most of them are well established researchers in India and abroad. And I really enjoyed that study and friendship which we developed and the basics what we studied which led to this stage. My masters I continued in the same college. Uh, I have studied in Satya Science Institute of Higher Learning where uh, we are taught human values along with the education and I believe that it has helped a lot and I dedicated all my work and things to uh, my guru Sri Satya Sai Baba who has always blessed and always told that science should be used to serve society. After my MSc, I was selected for a Swedish Institute guest research scholarship. It's a very competitive scholarship where 100 people are selected worldwide every year. And initially I was not selected in the main list. They said if any candidate from Asia who's got selected gets, rejects the fellowship, then you may be considered. So it was always, you know, a suspense whenever it comes to grant writing or scholarships that it was not a very easy way that I got it in the first shot. So this when I was traveling to Sweden, my boss, Dr. Karani Sanji, we use from Chennai. I had asked him that, you know, uh, do I need to buy a suit? He said, unless and until you are invited for a Nobel Prize ceremony, you have no business of bringing any formal clothes. You are coming to a university. It's Europe. So just come with T-shirt and jeans. So I <laughs> landed up there within one month. My scholarship people, they had a lucky drop and I won a ticket for attending the Nobel Prize ceremony. So I went to this shop. It's called uh, Salvation Army where you get used clothes. I didn't have money because I just landed from India and I haven't received my fellowship. So I went there and bought a blazer for 100 euros and I attended the ceremony. And it was a life changing event for me because till then I have only read about Nobel Prizes. I knew that I was going to university which gives Nobel Prizes, but somehow attending this Nobel Prize ceremony was a big deal for me because I still have that invitation with 
my name printed on it in gold. So this was another incident which happened after the Nobel Prize ceremony that uh, I had just joined Karolinska Institute and I just received my first month of fellowship of around 2000 euros and there was a credit of 10,000 euros into my account. So I asked my boss, he said some of these funding agencies have this habit of giving six months fellowship in one go. So probably you got it. So I wrote a mail to them thanking of giving me this lump sum money and they replied, no, we haven't sent you any money. So I go to the bank, try to find out who has transferred and they say this has come from Swedish Institute. So I go with those papers to their office go to the admin department. I, I, I told them that, you know, this money has come from your account. And they go and verify and they find that it was actually a clerical error. This money was supposed to go to somebody else and it came to my, my account. So I said, OK, what do you want me to do? You obviously have to return the money. I said, OK. And I transferred back the money. Next day, my boss, he gets a call from the Swedish Institute and they tell him like, who is this guy? From where did you get him? We have never seen such honest behavior. People coming from that side of the globe. Last year we had a student from Pakistan who joined, took the fellowship. After a month he went back to his country and he kept on taking the fellowship for one year. And here you have this guy from India who is coming and insisting that, you know, this is not my money, this is yours. So my boss said this because he has studied in Satya Science Institute of Higher Learning where, you know, he's taught of moral values, ethical values. So that's why, you know, he has done this. So they said we want to give him something. What do you suggest? So my boss said, OK, there is this international summer course coming in Paris. It's a 14 day course. If you want to really show him something, why don't you fund this conference, stay, travel, accommodation? And then <laughs> they transfer that money back to my account and told this is their gift to me to go and learn. Then I came back, uh, started my work here at uh, Dr. V. Mohan's uh, Diabetes Institute. Though I got tra trained in Sweden in type 1 diabetes, when I came back, he insisted that since his institute is focusing on type 2 diabetes, why don't you find a project in that? But from the beginning, I had always had a soft corner for children because they get a lot of these genetic disorders for which they have not done any crime, but genetic diseases comes to people randomly. So I insisted that I want to be the first student with him to start working on autoimmune diabetes. He said, OK, at your own risk. And Dr. Mohan, he had supported me all through my PhD time. Incidentally, his wife succumbed to cancer and that is the same time when my mom also got affected with the cancer and he gave me enough freedom and flexibility to work and also manage my family life and I am eternally grateful to him. And once I finished my PhD, he asked me, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go abroad for postdoc. But he said it might be a difficult situation because with your mother's condition, even if you go somewhere, you may have to come back and then once you return, it might be difficult. So he gave me an offer. Continue here. I'll send you to Steno Diabetes Center, Denmark. You can get trained there. That time the next generation sequencing had picked up and a lot of opportunities are there. So he said, why don't you set up a whole panel for different kind of diabetes and you can be with us. And I took the offer. Meanwhile, I was also Trying my luck. These are some of the publications which I have published during my PhDs. My mother's condition was making me difficult because my father, he was not able to manage it on his own and she has always motivated me. So even after my PhD, when I had opportunity to make money where I could have become an application specialist or I could have gone into sales, marketing and all that, she was the one who was insisting me that, look, we have studied science. You need to come back with something to serve the society. So she made me promise that I will never go behind money. So I got this offer from Market Pharma, wherein they were also giving me an insurance which could take care of my mom's treatment. I went back to Dr. Mohan and I told him, I've already taken your offer, but I have this. 
Now you tell me what to do. He said, Arun, you're my boy. You can come back to me anytime. Right now, you need some good experience. You need some money. Being at Dr. Mohan's, we won't be able to take care of the expenses for your mom's cancer treatment, but at least you can come back to us whenever you want. So that was a very good, uh, you know, mentorship or guidance which he gave me, which helped me change my field from genetics to cell biology and drug discovery, which was again a big task because when I joined Orchid, they said that your whole experience is in genetics and genomics, and we don't do any kind of work here. So you got six months time and I challenged them. I said, I don't need six months to prove myself. I'll prove myself in three months. And the journey in Orchid was a very roller coaster because I was the candidate with a PhD degree, so they expected me to be a leader. I had to handle three to four different therapeutic areas. People who were, you know, much experienced me because they had had a lot of years of experience working in this field. And I had a degree, but not experience with the cell biology or other drug discovery. But with my nature of, you know, a teamwork and leadership, I was able to uh, work with them and get a lot of work done and deliver. And many of these molecules entered the clinical trials. So I'm very thankful to my team from Orchid who were more of friends to me uh, than co-workers. And I always believe that uh, this kind of work relationship always helps you to bring best out of you as well as bringing best out of them. So I'm still in touch with them and many of them have gone to many other companies and they have been in touch with me and they have always helped me in my current job also by helping them helping to do a lot of studies in their pharma companies. So why I got into Duchenne muscular dystrophy? So till 2012, I was not very aware of this disease and a group of parents with muscular dystrophy, they wanted to set up a research and development center. So I was working with a company in Chennai for uh, next generation sequencing and uh, Shimpex Biotech which was located in ECR and the founder Thomas, he and me were friends and he said, Arun, you've got good experience in cell biology. Why don't you come? Let's set up a cell culture lab and uh, we have got this project wherein you'll be able to work on a rare disease. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a rare disease which affects more than three to five lakh children in India. Uh, the main sign is that they get skeletal muscle weaknesses leading to scoliosis and uh, usually the lifespan is limited to 18 to 25 because they suffer with cardiorespiratory issues and have an early death. This is our founder, Mr. Avdeep Singh Anand, whose son was diagnosed with DMD in 2003. And he started Dystrophy Annihilation Research Trust with a motivation to bring out some therapy. And I'm very lucky that I got this opportunity to join him. And uh, we started DART in 2012 in Chennai. Uh, this was incubated inside the Shimpex Biotech company where the, they have a thermo ion turret sequencing platform where we were screening for the mutations for DMD. And I was set, busy setting up a cell culture lab wherein I was generating cell lines of DMD patients. And we were supposed to screen the antisense oligonucleotides. It took two years for me to generate a lot of cell lines and then Anand connected me to Professor Steve Wilton from Murdoch University, who is the pioneer in exon skipping or known as father of exon skipping. And in 2015, I was sent to Australia for a six months stint to go and learn. Of course, when I was going, they assumed that I'm coming with zero experience. But in 45 days, I could learn everything and also started participating in the lab meetings and they were quite impressed with the way I was giving input. So they said, we didn't know that you have got good experience working in this. I said, no, with exon skipping, I don't have, but I have had enough experience with genomics, genetics, and cell biology. I just wanted to come and see how you guys do it so that I can go home and you know, transfer this whole technology and do it. So my six months trip was cut down to two months and I was back to India. So we were working on this uh, Antisense oligonucleotide based ex exon skipping. I will briefly tell you the mechanism behind it. So, dystrophin gene is the biggest gene in the human body and it's got 79 exons. And 
you can imagine the permutation and combinations of mutations which patient can get from exam number 1 to 79 the different types of mutations which we screen to see is starting with common form of deletions followed by duplications missense mutations nonsense mutation frame shift mutation point mutations so it becomes a big challenge for us to find out a therapy which is going to be personalized and this was the challenge and that's why probably nobody was doing it here in the, our country but with the help of steve i could learn how to do it but the challenge was that how do we do it back in india also just going back i told you about my nobel prize uh, ceremony episode i had witnessed barry marshall getting the nobel prize and when i landed in perth while we were going from the airport to the lab i suddenly see barry marshall avenue so in this picture the lady professor sue fletcher who is to be who is with steve i asked her does professor barry marshall live here he said yeah he is very close friend of my husband do you want to meet him i said yeah it would be a opportunity for me to meet him so we go to his lab and uh, while i'm waiting for him to come to the office i am searching for something and then he walks in and he says mate are you looking for this and he opens a safe picks out the nobel prize and i was so lucky i could i held it for nearly half an hour during the whole episode of me uh, narrating our experience he has come to india so many times he was sharing some episodes and at the end he gives me a souvenir which is a nobel prize chocolate version <laughs> i still haven't eaten it <laughs> <laughs> so this was something i told him i have seen you live while taking the nobel prize 10 years back and i am seeing you now after we came back i convinced anand that working in chennai is not going to work him being in bangalore me being in chennai this long distance relationship is not possible and uh, since dart was formed in karnataka we were not getting much help from the tamil nadu government also steve wilton that time he was listing india for a conference and we timed it well so we inaugurated the r and d in bangalore this is actually set up in a house which belongs to professor cnr rao which we didn't know while taking only when we had to sign the agreement we were called inside iic and it was just you know <laughs> by fluke somehow we are connected to cnr so dr vishwanathan our pediatric neurologist he was also there during the inauguration and this was one of the major decision which we took where me and my team decided to move from chennai to bangalore the biotech hub of india my inspiration behind all this is karanveer son of mr anand who is a very brilliant kid he talked in cbsc 10th CBC class 12 currently is finishing his BSc final years at MS Ramaya with 100% scholarship he wants to become a scientist like me his father is amused by <laughs> while we were setting up the lab back in bangalore because we had to break all our cell culture lab panels and set it back there is this company from us called ptc therapeutics who give some kind of grants for patient organizations for doing some kind of social work in the field of muscular dystrophy so we came me and my team uh, bertie ashley my fellow scientist from chennai we came up with this idea called dart mobile dart mobile is a vehicle which goes around rural parts of karnataka spreading awareness of the disease we conduct camps and we help them in getting diagnosis so with the help of national health mission and uh, rural uh, primary and secondary tertiary health care centers we had got this opportunity so we got this award of $25000 from it's called strive for dmd award we got this award in 2016 and by the time we got the permissions we were allowed to conduct few camps across tumkur mandya ramnagar so we went around spreading about awareness about the disease and helping people diagnose we could uh, impact the lives of nearly 250 patients and we identified nearly 30 new mutations through this project we were supported by strand life sciences in this 
So even though we were getting funding from the donors, which are DMD patients, as research point of view, it was very important for me to establish my mark with the regulatory and scientific agencies in India. So we were mentored by Professor Vijay Raghav in that time. He was in NCBS and he was more accessible. Right now he's become a principal advisor for government of India. So still we keep in touch. He advised that, you know, you need to first get DSIR recognition as a scientific industrial research organization. So me and my founder, Mr. Anand, we went to Delhi. We made the presentation. So that time the head of DSIR, Dr. S.K. Deshpande, he said, look, you are just a team of five people. DSIR certifications are given to universities, medical colleges or biotech companies who have in-house R&D. We want to come and see what you're doing. If you believe it, you will get it. So they got a team of uh, experts who came and visited our lab. Then they were convinced and they gave us the certificate and we have up for renewal for the third time now. Meanwhile, I had also uh, written to so many companies for grants and uh, MedGenome has got a not-for-profit organization called SciGenome Research Foundation, wherein they had this uh, grant wherein you could write genomics projects and they will give it in kind in the form of services. So I proposed this study wherein we had around 25 families affected with DMD and we studied the matrilineage analysis that is four generations, mother, grandmother, great grandmother and great grand grandmother. We studied in this 25 families. It came to almost 96 samples and SciGenome Research Foundation had given this grant to us and with the help of little funding from Stand License also, we published two papers and both of them are right now available online. And currently we use this NGS panel for screening for our patients for developing the therapy. We knew that I didn't want to repeat my episode of PhD with a lot of genomics sequencing and I wanted to get it in the real game that is developing our own drug. So I convinced Anand that we need to get our own synthesizer for making the oligonucleotides. We got a very good deal from GE, Cytiva. We set up the first oligosynthesis unit here. And we could successfully make the first molecule. Of course, we are still making a lot. But this was again a landmark achievement for us of making our own drug. So this led to the birth of Hanujan. That is my startup wherein we focus on CMP grade oligonucleotide facility. So there is a story behind the name Hanujan. Hanu in Sanskrit, thanks to my grandfather, I'm still influenced by Sanskrit a lot. Hanu in Sanskrit means various kinds of drugs. And also probably I like Hanuman a lot because Hanuman got uh, Sanjeevani to save Lakshmana. So Hanujan was born in 2017 with the motivation of creating affordable oligonucleotide based therapy for rare disorders. We received the idea to POC or Elevate Award from the government of Karnataka. And uh, this was a starting for us to get into the preclinical development. And with this funding, we could achieve a lot. And following year, I also got the Biotechnology Initiation Grant from BIRAC. And we continued the development. And uh, I'm very thankful to these agencies, uh, both uh, BIRAC, Government of Karnataka, KBITS, ICMR and other agencies who have supported us in our journey here. And more than that, the parents who have given the motivation to work on it. We uh, inaugurated our GMP facility in 2019. And uh, Professor Swami Swaminathan, who that time used to be the DG of ICMR, in one of the rare disease meetings, I am part of a lot of rare disease committees and meetings, so we keep going to Delhi every year. And uh, in one of those meetings, that time she was the DG of ICMR, she was present. And me and Anand were there and we literally took the mic and started abusing the funding agencies that they are not supporting us. And she said, OK, why don't you come and meet me? She gave us an appointment to visit her in the ICMR headquarters. And I went and presented our preclinical data and I said we need help. She said, OK, I'm coming to Bangalore next week for an event at Ramaya College. Let me come and see your lab. And she came, visited that time. It was Children's Day, 
So all of our DMD kids were also there. And then she said, OK, I want to see the lab. And I took her inside Professor CNRR's house, which we have converted into a lab. And it was a five minute tour and she came out and she said, so all the data you presented, you did it in this house. I said, yes, ma'am. I'm very ashamed that ICMR has not supported you till date. You please submit a proposal and I'm going to help you. And this was the latest uh, video which she had sent to, uh, for the World Rare Disease Day on February 28th. We are still in touch and she keeps helping us. So we submitted this proposal with all the preclinical data to ICMR for conducting the first study on a single patient uh, using a multiple exon skipping approach on Mr. Anand's son. And uh, we presented to the committee. By then, Soumya had left ICMR and joined WHO. So it took some time, but we got the approval to do the first single patient study. And this is Karan getting his first shot. This was again a life changing moment for us because uh, it's very easy to do research, but how do you translate it? How do it's very nice to hear you know, lab to bench, bedside, bench side to bedside. But <laughs> I am very lucky that I got to see something what I made going to a patient. He's on our drug now, three years are over. Uh, this is one of the awards which we got from uh, Alert. It's an NGO which uh, is dedicated in saving human lives. They teach a lot of uh, life saving skills so that you know human life is very precious and everybody should know how to save a life. As Dinesh was saying about National Safety Week, uh, probably you can invite Alert. Alert does a lot of corporate trainings to people. Alert every year identifies individuals and organizations who are into the business or into the activities of saving lives and they identified me and Dart and uh, they called us to Chennai to receive this award. We also tied up with uh, Reprocell, who is a big leading company with Biosa uh, into different kind of cell lines and oligonucleotides. And we had a partnership with the help of CCAM, wherein we tied up to give GMP grade oligos to them. Collaboration is the key in moving forward. In 2020, based on our single patient study, we had applied to the Drug Controller General of India for conducting a Pan India clinical trial, and we got the approval. It's going to happen in eight different cities in nine different hospitals. Meanwhile, they asked the question, where are you going to manufacture the drug? Which pharma company is going to make it? We said we already have one, Hanujan. And Hanujan got the manufacturing license to make the drug for TARTS clinical trial. In 2021, there was a big high court hearing happening because a lot of rare disease patients in India are you know, suffering and there is nothing much happening from the government side. So they had so many petitions have been filed on case against Ministry of Health and Government of India that nothing has been, nothing is available for these patients and so many are dying every year. So the Chief Justice Pratibha Singh, she wanted to find out who is, which companies are working and then Dart's name comes up and I am sent a summons. So me and Anand, we go to Delhi. Of course, that time due to COVID, we couldn't directly go to the court. So it was a virtual hearing. So me and Anand sitting in the hotel. Justice Pratipa said, OK, so can you just tell what you have done? And she gives me 25 minutes to explain what we have done. And I present this whole data of my preclinical approvals, everything. And she says, wow, OK, I am forming a committee. You'll be part of that. And let's see, we need to get something to these patients as quickly as possible. So I'm part of that committee. We hope something comes out soon. In 2021, uh, I in collaboration with IIT Jodhpur and AIMS Jodhpur, we got this SCRB IRFA grant. It's from the Department of Science and Technology, where I am collaborating with IIT Jodhpur and AIMS Jodhpur. And uh, IIT Jodhpur has now a dedicated tuition muscular dystrophy center where we are collaborating and we want to come out with novel molecules which will help a lot of patients. In 2021, your story featured our story of both Dart and Hanujan and uh, it was also among the top 25 stories to inspire people. I'm very thankful to that. 
i keep continuing to learn i go and meet my collaborators the lady on the left she is professor anamik from lighten medical university center she is a pioneer in exon skipping and uh, i had met lot of scientists and i keep visiting learning and coming back and trying to establish because learning is a continuous process and there is no age to it i am also motivated by lot of indian women entrepreneurs and eminent scientists who motivate us uh, this is dr renu swarup who keeps supporting us so in that high court hearing she was the main chair person and uh, dr kiran who is also a motivation to us who has shown the way how an entrepreneur can you know become successful and uh, i want to come out with a successful product for dushan muscular dystrophy uh, this is my interaction with different scientists uh, in the neuromuscular uh, field this is professor andoni and this is from ptc therapeutics uh, there is dr charles kersberg who is a pioneer in crispr based genome editing for uh, dushan muscular dystrophy so like to collaborate and work with all of them and i like to keep learning and working in the lab although now most of the time i'm busy with admin work but whenever i get time i would like to go back to the lab this is my team we started with five members and now we are 12 i am very grateful to my team because they have been working tirelessly poeti shabri ravi keerthi deepika manjula anand mohan karan parmesh manoj vishwa so without them i won't be able to speak like this and tell my story here so apart from i'm not doing research i like to cook and i am jack of all musician i like to play a lot of instruments that's my passion and we have been covered with lot of uh, media coverage on our work on our uh, approvals and uh, online and offline media we are aspiring to annihilate muscular dystrophy through the power of science and these kids are my inspiration and motivation and i hope that i achieve this so thank you Dr. Arun, thank you. Um, it's every slide is a story. You can speak, you know, hours on each one of them, but uh, we just walk through, uh, leading with the life with the purpose. So it certainly inspired all of us. I just want to open up for the questions. So I'm sure some of the topics we touched also, as as a connect, it will be helpful for the team to ask some questions. So, team, open for questions to Dr. Arun. Let me start out. I think you know, every stage when we cross, right? I think there's always someone who's leading you into one direction which you're not aware of, right? And, and those are some very critical decisions you made, especially when you have to work with Mohan and get Dorkin. What's a key life-changing moment as, a, as an inflection point we always call this in our career? Where you made that critical decision? Just well, where you stand today, uh, but that little bit of reflection. Here. It's all uh, based on the personal motivation. Of course, uh, continuing with Mohan would have been more comfortable, but uh, my uh, issue with my mother was always, you know, even though I was working uh, with Mohan when uh, she was diagnosed with uh, initially uh, oligarchal cancer, and then she was had the surgery here in Bangalore. and then after a couple of months she started getting abdominal distension and uh, they identified a new cancer and then the doctors had you know written could be a hnpcc mutation and i was looking for him i was working on genomics and sequencing and all that and i found that adr cancer institute has this facility so i took a blood from my mother i went to kerala to her blood sample came back isolated the dna at mdrf went to meet dr rajkumar at adr cancer institute and he said it's a research project till we get 10000 samples we won't start the work because we are waiting for a funding so probably still that sample is lying there and i felt very frustrated because even during my phd i used to take lot of blood from these kids and every time i was approached by them that do we have a cure when will my son get cured of diabetes and i didn't have an answer because i was hunting for genes not for a cure so i always had this thing okay i need to i mean i can't get stuck with one technique or one Field. I want to learn, and that learning 
help me push it was very difficult to get a pharma job i applied so many times of course i had some friends who referred my cv internally i do know how it corporate thing works being in an academics or a research institute you are not taught those things so you don't know the tricks of the trade but somehow i got lucky when i went to orchid for the interview they said you don't have experience working with drug discovery or cell biology can you learn and come we'll give you one month time your job is guaranteed now where do i go and learn so i went back to dr mohan i said doctor i reached this stage they are asking me to get a training dr mohan was kind enough he said okay we have a cell culture lab go and meet the head of cell biology department and they trained me <laughs> now only your mentors can really see through you and see your potential and help you and guide you all that would have been easy for me to take the thing and he so i am always you know i go back to my mentors i go back to my leaders they give you that advice they know you sometimes they see you in a different way so they get the big picture even when i got into the muscular dystrophy i went to him he said oh you left our kid and you are becoming an entrepreneur okay who is your motivation i said you you started from scratch now you are a world famous diabetologist i know i don't want to become that big but i want to do something which will make a difference so these kind of things helps you will get a thought but you need that support and people who will motivate you and guide you which my family has supported the friend circle i am in touch with all of them from my alumni colleges to companies and all of them have helped here all the studies were done in glp approved labs in jubilant where my peers from orchid they helped me crack the deals there great 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 story thank you so much can i ask you sure question, please so uh, why does uh, the exam skippy happens after you uh, use an anti cell so you technically speaking anti cells is like a micro rna right yeah so it's supposed to repress the translation yeah so uh, how does it work so it acts only on the pre mrna and uh, yeah. yeah so what is the uh, so basically uh, exon skipping mechanism works at the pre mrna mrna level so there are two ways either you silence a gene or you suppress or you activate so in this case in case of dmd if if i give you an example there is a deletion of exon number 52 in a patient we design an antisense oligonucleotide with an exon intron boundary of exon 51 so this whole exon skipping works like a zigzag puzzle each of these exons has got a separate shape and the nucleotide line so it's not that you can remove any knock any you can knock out any of the exon and it restores the reading frame so this only works on few cases so 80 to 90% of the dmd mutations can be corrected by single or multiple exon skipping so we use something called exon splicing enhancers so we design the oligos in such a way that it goes and binds at the intron exon boundary and it removes it off and then there is a patching which happens so it's more like a molecular patch which we are doing now this is a effect which is temporary so the patient will require weekly injections now with the new genome editing technology this edit can be a permanent thing wherein you will have a uh, option of removing the exon and also repairing it so that that effect is permanent that is the feature but the loss of that exon means that some part of protein is not yes good. so there will be a partially functional protein which will be produced but which will be clinically beneficial right now we are converting the duchenne muscular dystrophy which is a severe disease towards becker muscular dystrophy which is a milder form of the disease becker patients have the same mutation in the dmd gene but it's a slowly progressive form a becker patient can live more than 70 years he will be able to walk but slowly he will never go into a wheelchair whereas in the case of dmd they might go into the wheelchair by the age of 10 to 12 so if we give the therapy at the right age we can hope that they don't go into the wheelchair I ask another question is about you know Dr. Samia visiting was a game changer yeah. right she said I see him as not doing enough right and she took it so it's an that individual made the difference to show that fast track right so that is one of the pain points in our mm-hmm. system so how is it working with systems and how we should you could be an example setting example for others who are all struggling to make that to 
a DCG approval or regulatory, especially in the rare diseases, right, which doesn't get the attention which needed uh, compared to the, you know, the, the West side, <laughs> where uh, rare disease becomes much more easier for regulatory yes. aspect of. We are still uh, quite nascent when it comes to rare diseases because right now, see, I could give a good example of COVID. COVID came and then we got emergency use authorization. So these kind of things need to be brought to rare diseases. In US, already they have started N is equal to one clinical trial. Yeah. There is an antisense oligonucleated called Milasin, which was made only for one patient. In that story, the doctor himself did the research, got the sequencing done, developed the antisense oligonucleated. Within a span of six months, the drug was from lab to clinic. And it was made and the US FDA gave approval to that patient. So a lot of things exist, but we need to slowly adapt. We need uh, leaders and stakeholders who are sitting in this agencies to be considerate. Um, I got a DCG approval. I know how many times I had to go. Initially, when we went, they said we have a book called Schedule uh, Drug and Cosmetic Act in that there is a schedule Y. You need to do 75 different studies. Even if one is not there, your application is rejected. When you spend $2 million doing all the studies, you go back to them and then they screen your application. But all those studies are relevant to small molecules and other things. For a rare disease patient who doesn't survive more than 20, there need to be orphan drug act, orphan drug rules. So a lot of things have changed now. I have seen three different ICMR DGs, three different DCGA DGs, and rules have changed and it's becoming more easier. And there are a lot of committees which uh, we need to go through so that you know whatever we do is done properly with ethics and scientific background. Of course, patient safety is the most important thing. Yeah. But we need to have, we need to create the revolution. Why can't we do that same example of Milasan? Yeah. ICMR helped us. We got that first patient study done as a research project. Mm -hmm. But now it has to be translated to all, so many. I was speaking with Ganesh, he has worked with Red Syndrome. There are so many, 7,000 rare diseases in the country. Yeah. <laughs> so of course we have opened the gates now. So we are open to develop any drug with this technology. We have, you know, already so many in the pipeline for ataxias, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So this can be applied and we need help. We need help. We need a good partnership with the, you know, companies, pharma companies, scientific companies. It can be done. It can be as absolutely. Yeah. Hello, this is Iran. Yes. Nice to hear your CEO, I wanted to actually ask a question on precision medicine or, or targeted therapies. What do you yeah. think is the regulatory landscape over there? Because in some ways it is going to be more individualized. Yes. And there's a trade-off between how many you test versus how quickly you act. So how do you think things are going to change over? Well, already uh, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, companies cropping up in India also who are getting into CAR T cell therapies and other things. Uh, many of them happen within the hospitals with approvals of the ethics committees because uh, N is equal to one kind of model is still not approved here. But a lot of regulations have come in place. A lot of new committees are there which are screening these things. And for, uh, with you know CRISPR based gene editing also coming in, in the West already they have achieved a good success in sickle cell anemia wherein uh, even after nine months, uh, there is no relapse. So a lot of development is happening. Again, with the patent issues now, a lot of biotech companies are in uh, juggling uh, things, but I'm sure they'll sort it out. So in India also, I think uh, we are geared up for it, but uh, who will be the first? We don't know, but it's possible because there are uh, the, so, there's a lot of pressure from the patient groups and the communities to all these agencies. Sure. Yeah, my question is more towards what do you think is the input analytic that is required for you to qualify a patient to receive an NS21 therapy? Because see, it's a matter of taking a call on a very fine line. If you inject a agent, it could do nothing. It could be neutral or it could be deleterious, right? When you're thinking about even cancer therapy, it's yeah. sort of completely dictated now by the information genome. Yeah. So I wanted to get your information or an understanding. Yeah, How do you think? yeah regulatory framework is not there, but uh, there are a lot of this uh, cancer based things where they are doing uh, 
personalized pharmacogenomic approach where they are trying to repurpose drugs based on some scientific input but again there is some kind of safety data required which needs to be submitted so there are different committees when it comes to these kind of therapies whether it is cell based or whether it is a drug based so uh, drug control general of india has got different cells which handles different kind of applications uh, whether it can be a stem cell based approach or a small molecule based approach so uh, we need to find out exactly what but there will be some kind of checklist which requires you know in vitro studies are still not considered as a qualifying data they ask always for some kind of animal toxicity studies wherein and uh, some genome toxicity studies so that you know the sip studies which doesn't uh, cause any new mutations in the patient so there will be still some at least 30 40 studies which will be mandatory to be done based on which kind of therapy because they are more concerned that you know uh, safety of the patient is more important than efficacy so the all the agencies whether it is fda or uh, dcgi they are very strict on that so we had to undergo lot of studies to show that it is safe repeated dose of toxic studies maximum tolerated dose studies you know right. the problem really is long term safety and short term yes, safety yes. long term itself can be very long to establish so our therapy is like once in a week injection so they asked to do a repeated dose studies and show the proof and literally that one single patient study helped us to show that it was safe so that kind of thing needs to be done probably it has to start on a research phase because a lot of things can be done if there is a hospital which is ready to collaborate the ethics committees who are ready to you know do things safely then it could be done as an academic research project initially and then taken over to a full fledged drug sure. I'm, I'm this is a last question what do you think about the way medical education is organized in this country we don't really have it seems to be more in the practice mode rather than in the research mode that's if i were to put so, it you already, don't have a dovetailing with molecular sciences still already they have sown the seeds uh, you must have read the news that uh, indian yeah, institute yes, yes, hospital i studied at i uh, karlinska institute which is a university hospital wherein most of the phd pis are all clinicians who have had their full clinical training and then getting into the research so that really changes the game here dr mo mentor he is a clinician but he is also an avid researcher so this will really help because there is a lot of gap which needs to be bridged between the academics and the medical community it can only happen when you know there is a we all need to be you know in the same room yeah definitely if there are some inputs on that it will be nice over time to see how an organization like yours can also get into bridging that gap like, yeah. thank you for sharing your journey we have been supported by a lot of uh, clinicians who you know have uh, been part that's why our uh, clinical trials is going to happen in so many centers and i have been you know supported by very uh, eminent doctors who see sense in our research and they are ready to support us they come to our meetings when we had to meet the regulators and they have you know so it's very encouraging that uh, they are supporting us thank you thank you we're on top of the time but uh, again dr arun it's a, it's a great to hear and i think the team will who has any other questions will reach out to you and it might also open up some collaborations uh, arun is also with us so commercial leader there's something we can talk after this meeting and um, yeah uh, all the best with your your vision the mission and uh, open more you know glades as india research has to progress and uh, set some examples so um, look to partner if anything which we can do it in the future so many thanks i want to thank also parveen actually through parveen is only we i got to know you and uh, uh, really want to thank her to make the introduction to have this be the shift up great and you mentioned collaboration many a time so something we're also really really keen to drive it forward so thanks so much again dr arun thank you so much for coming all the way and being with us it's a absolute honor so thank, you, thank you your your dad shastri to join us so thank you sir for joining us so the son is doing a great job for us there thank you have a wonderful weekend team take care bye bye